in, but um, Professor Mike Mazar, um, who I, I knew myself from NDU, but he's a senior political scientist at RAND. And this might be the biggest crowd I've seen for a launch yet this year. So obviously a lot of interest. I think it's a little infamous among faculty for being amazing. Um, he teaches a globalization course in the spring that a lot of students really enjoy and 500 in the fall. So um, today he's going to be talking about his latest book, Leap of Faith, and you should make sure you buy a copy before or after for sure since he's here. I'm sure he will love this line of work. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to let him uh, talk about his book. Thanks. Thank you all for coming. Um, I was assured that they didn't uh, publicize what they were going to be serving for lunch, so, but I still think the food is a, a main draw, but I'm glad you came out. <laughs> um, I think the topic is really timely, and it, it kind of is, is perennially timely, because really what I was investigating in the book is how the United States was from there. And obviously over the last couple of years, there have been a couple of uh, examples, cases in the news, and there still are, there is at least one where uh, these issues may crop up again. So. In terms of the relevance, which is where I'll end uh, after just a few minutes, um, I think that's to me what makes it continually interesting and kind of worried. Because one of the implications I draw from this case is that the American the process of going to war in the United States is fundamentally broken, institutionally, substantively, and otherwise. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But I basically just talk about three things in regard to the book. One is just a little bit about the story it tells, because it basically is a story. Um, I you know, used all the open source documents I could find, all the declassified documents, all the, the memoirs that have been written. I did about 100 interviews with people who participated in the process. Um, just for information, I did not interview kind of the big five of, of Bush, Cheney, Rumsfeld, Powell, or Rice. Um, apart from them, I had a pretty good sampling from kind of cabinet level, um, deputy level, and then on down of people who participated in the process try to get a sense of how it unfolded. Um, and so mostly this, the, the book is a, it tells the story. Um, it's not primarily a theoretical book, although as I'll talk about, I draw a couple of lessons in that regard. Um, and I'll give you just a couple of examples of the main findings of the story piece and, and one case of uh, kind of an interesting story that's in there. But there's a lot of other anecdotes and examples that we can talk about if you want. Um, secondly, I'll just briefly mention the kind of framework I developed in the book to think about how um, the United States goes to war. What are the factors that impel us to the war in Iraq? Things we should watch out for in other cases. And then third, kind of uh, apply it to today. So first of all, the story. Um, essentially, the the you know one of the most important things to realize about uh, the decision in uh, ultimately the final choice uh, or the final kind of cherry on top in March 2003 when President Bush actually gives the order is that this is not out of the blue. This is a decision that is in a lot of ways over a decade in the making from the end of the first Gulf War. And as you know, um, and that's kind of where I pick up the story is um, with the, the, the end of the first Gulf War and the evolution of policy during the 90s and then into the Bush administration. Um, so obviously, as you know, we come out of the Gulf War feeling in part that we really dodged a bullet. Uh, because the intelligence finding after that war is that Saddam was much closer to the possession of nuclear weapons than we thought beforehand. Uh, he turned out to have been much more aggressive than we assumed. So the idea kind of is uh, this guy is a malignant tumor in international politics and we can't um, fall for him again. Uh, during the 90s, there's of course a long series of uh, back and forth um, warnings and arguments and strikes and near wars and we thought in 94 he was about ready to attack Kuwait again and um, we go through all that process during the period where we are internalizing the idea that Saddam is this terrible evil. And as some of you know, um, by the end of the Clinton administration, they had decided that regime change was the only appropriate option for the United States. So by about 98, 99, you're in a position where, and talking to people who were in the Clinton administration at the time, they said, you know, part of the reason when the Bush administration started talking about this, that we didn't think it was crazy, was we had already got there. The regime change was what had to happen. Now, they weren't ready to go to war, but that basic idea was already established in the Clinton administration. One of the interesting things about this is, you know, by the time you get these this discussion proposals in, in all of 2002, um, there's not a lot of outrage. There's not a lot of sense of people just up and arm, like, what are they talking about? At least within the National Security Committee. Part of that's because this idea been established. 
So that's established. Now, when the Bush administration comes in, one of the aspects of the story that I, that I try to uh, tell and, and deal with is a lot of these theories out there for how the war happened. You know, Dick Cheney made it happen, Halliburton made it happen, we wanted to control the oil, it was the Trilateral Commission, it was I don't, whatever. And basically, I argue that none of that is true, that the essential story of what happened was that there were those in the Bush administration who came into office believing that Saddam was a threat that had to be dealt with, but how to do that wasn't really clear. And then after 9-11, President Bush and many others came to the conclusion that they could not fulfill their obligations to keep the American people safe if they left them in power. Now, I think there's a lot of reasons why that judgment was mistaken. And uh, as I'll talk about, sort of guided by urgency and imperative. But fundamentally, the argument I make is, you know, you've got this spectrum of people who say it was, you know, a great thing and we should have done it all the way to it was an ultimate crime. And I'm sort of in the middle of that spectrum and saying, basically, I think most of the reasons why senior officials gave publicly as to why they did this were honest, at least as far as that goes, that they were saying that they really believed the intelligence, they believed Saddam was a threat, they didn't have a secret motive particularly. But the Bush administration first comes in, the first nine months before 9-11, also, for those who believe that you know Bush came into office determined to get rid of Saddam because Saddam tried to kill his dad and all this kind of stuff, uh, the dominant story of policy making during that early period is kind of lack of direction and a lot of random discussion of different options that didn't really settle on anything, a lot of dissatisfaction in the policy process. You have this smart sanctions discussion going on where the United States <laughs> realizes the sanctions regime is kind of collapsing and tries to focus it. Uh, there were definitely folks like Paul Wolfowitz pushing uh, the idea of more actively supporting opposition groups in Iraq who might be able to overthrow Saddam. So that's going on, but there were a lot of others who, you know, Powell and others, and even Rice, who kind of thought that was silly and was never going to really amount to anything. So before 9 11, there was no coherent plan to get rid of Saddam in the U.S. government. Um, in August, they'd come out with a new strategy, but, and it had some of that rhetoric in there, but there was not a lot of firm direction. And then, of course, after 9-11, it instantly goes into everybody's mind that this is what they have to do. So on the afternoon of 9-11, you have Steve Cambone, one of Rumsfeld's top assistants, writing notes that the 9-11 Commission gets a hold of, where Rumsfeld is musing at about 2.30 that afternoon, uh, you know, find out if Saddam was involved, um, and uh, hit targets connected and not. So very quickly, they get this conception of the war on terror and what it has to involve, which is not just getting rid of al-Qaeda, but creating a demonstration effect of taking actions that shock the world and create the idea that nobody should mess with the United States by doing something like this again. And Saddam Hussein is the first natural target that occurs to them to achieve that kind of effect. So on that afternoon, you have that discussion. You have a bunch of U.S. officials, including Doug Feist, John Abzay, and others, who had been in Germany for uh, policy making stuff and were coming back on a plane together, who basically that day are on the plane and come to the same basic conclusions that uh, the war on terror has to be very general and has to achieve big effects and transformative effects. And at least in some of their minds that Saddam Hussein, uh, after, or in some cases, some of them came back arguing that even before we went after Afghanistan, even before we went after the Taliban, we should take out Saddam Hussein because that would send the right kind of signal. So immediately after 9-11, this becomes a, a, a sense on the part of some that it has to happen quickly. Um, it then takes a while to work itself out in the policy process. So on the 14th, 15th of September, you have this famous Camp David meeting where they all talk about the war on terror and a lot is agreed upon. Paul Wolfowitz <coughs> is urgently pushing the idea of Iraq. President Bush is a little bit taken aback by this, and with some other officials, kind of takes him off the side and says, what's going on with this? Why is he shoving this down my throat? I'm not quite ready to do this. And it becomes even a little heated. And at some point, Bush is telling Wolfowitz, look, just shut up already. I got your message. I'm not doing this right now. And there's different interpretations of that. Based on that and some other meetings, you get Paul O'Neill coming out in his kind of statements in the book that's written by Ron Suskind, 
saying the United States was ready to go after Iraq from day one, and at Camp David they made this decision, and no, not really. At Camp David, the clear decision was made that they were going to Afghanistan first, but interestingly, the official uh, policy documents that defense prepared for that meeting three days after 9-11 said the war on terror is general war on terror, Afghanistan, and Iraq all in the first phase. We're going after Iraq very quickly, and there was some initial discussion that even by the spring of 2002, they wanted to be in a position to do this. That quickly went by the boards. But Bush decides, no, not Iraq. But pretty much everybody interprets that, I think correctly, that his message was not just yet. I pretty much know we have to do this, but we have to get there. And then that triggers this long process that you know, we can talk about different parts if we want of the decision process and the UN process and the inspections process. Um, and one of the interesting things about that, an interesting thing about this case, that you see this kind of line in a lot of uh, case studies of decision making, there never really was a decision moment. I mean, for one thing, there was never a meeting where they got the cabinet together and said, we're here to debate whether going to Iraq or whether Iraq is a good idea. They never had a meeting to discuss that question. It emerged by osmosis they started having a lot of deputies and other interagency meetings about what to do to get ready for it. But they never actually really debated that point. And there never was one moment where they got everyone and said, okay, this is the time we're going to make a decision. So the decision kind of emerged gradually over time. And when you add, when I would ask interviews, okay, you tell me when the decision was made. I get answers everything from 9-11 to, you know, March 19th or whatever of 2003. It just wasn't clear. And one of the implications of that is that you have very senior officials, including um, Secretary of State Powell, who are kind of watching an official track of decision and saying, well, I don't see a lot that's happened yet. Therefore, we can't be that close to going to war. But there was an unofficial track where it was sort of assumed immediately that we were going to war and we're getting ready to do it. And those people believed all along. So you get in June of 2002, you got Richard Cross, then the director of policy planning, going to kind of these rice and saying, you know, we're hearing a lot of this discussion of going to war with Iraq, but we haven't debated, we haven't talked about it, we gotta have a decision process, we're gonna do that. And she said, Richard, that decision's been made. Just hold your breath because we're already we're already there. Now we're working it out. And the senior aide to Colin Powell was shocked that the US government had made the decision to go to war. So that's how this sort of was emerging almost by happenstance. Uh, a lot of fascinating and in many cases depressing stories of how that process unfolded, um, all the way up to the February 2003 event, this what they called a rock drill at the National Defense University, where they got a bunch of planners together, led at that time by uh, Jay Garner, who'd been put in touch of the uh, Orha group, where everybody I talked to who walked away from that meeting said, this is a disaster in the making. This is an absolute disaster in the making. And the question I asked everybody was, why didn't you go back to your boss and tell them that? And most of them didn't. A few of them said, you know, I mean, that's another aspect of this that as, as current or aspiring practitioners, it's really interesting to think about is when you're sitting in a room like that and you see a disaster unfolding, what do you do? Because the dominant answer I got, um, I mean, fascinating, one discussion with a senior NSC staffer who, uh, not about that many particular, but similar things, kind of like, once you realize that this was all screwed up, why didn't you do, why didn't you run into the president's, you had access to the president. Why didn't you go in and pound your hand on the desk and say, look, I'm not trying to say, don't do this. I'm not trying to be a complete, you know, uh, dissenter here. But you gotta know, Mr. President, this is set to school. And the answer was, the first thing out of his mouth was, you know, that's very interesting you ask that because sitting here right now, I can't come up with a good answer. And that's kind of the answer I got back from most people was the momentum of policy becomes so powerful that they didn't see really a reason to that to go. So anyway, lots of things happened in the post process. One particular warning that was very interesting is an example of this that I sort of had been briefly reported in Doug Pye's memoir, but I kind of found out more details, was through various happenstance kind of a temporary fill-in DASD official was in a meeting and heard a discussion of the post-war and had been involved in planning for Panama and Haiti and said, you know, I don't really see a lot of planning going on for the post-war, 
So he approached Doug Fife and said, because Doug Fife's memo or message to this group was, well, we're kind of stuck at the UN for a while. Seems like we're not going to be invading as quickly as we thought. So we got some time. Anybody got any ideas of other ways we should prepare for this war? I'm paraphrasing, but that was sort of the message. Um, so he said, yeah, well, why don't we do more thinking about the post-war because we've learned in the past that order can quickly collapse. And Fife said, sure. Well, so he goes back to his office, picks this Marine colonel who is sitting there minding his own business. And the guy walks up and says, okay, look into this. So this Marine colonel spends about two weeks <laughs> and ends up with a pile of reports on Iraq this high in his office and writes a 14-page memo that says, we are about to really screw this up. That post-war chaos is a, as he put it, win the war, lose the peace issue. That this is the classic problem of post-war stability we encounter in every one of these situations. We have not organized to do this, and it is going to be a problem. And oh, by the way, because I'm a Marine, I'm not just saying what the problem is. If you want to solve the problem, Here's a 10 page outline of a post-war policing activity that you could implement if you wanted to do something about this. Then what comes back to the, the dash, he's like, mm, okay, kind of what I expected, sends it to Fife, and Fife is like, wow, well that's really uh, disturbing. Um, I don't really like some of it, do it again. So they do it again, it comes back, now it's February, so it's very late, February 2003. And at that point, it kind of goes up in smoke. Fife says that he, he forwarded it to the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Peter Pace. Pace is saying he doesn't remember getting it. Um, wasn't apparently brought to the attention of Rumsfeld. You know, there's dozens of examples of things like that where people who really take the time to look at what's going on say in terms of at least the post-war planning, there's a lot of problems here uh, and they just don't get listened to. So part of the reason for that, and then I'll pop. So, Obviously, you get up to March, Bush decides Saddam hasn't given in, the UN route hasn't achieved enough, and as, as most people in the process knew from September 2001, they end up going to war. And one of the, so part of the argument I make in the book is there's a couple of factors that to me really uh, help explain why that happens that are common to a lot of cases of going to war in the United States. And there's two and a half, three that I kind of emphasize in the book. Um, and one of them is sort of, for those of you that have taken or are taking 500, sort of a constructivist argument about evolved collective beliefs. And in the United States case, it's pretty obvious, right? It's American exceptionalism. It's the idea deeply embedded in the American national security establishment that uh, the United States has certain rights and responsibilities to solve problems all over the world. And in a lot of countries, if you have uh, a, a, a Paul Wolfowitz or a, a Rumsfeld or a Cheney say we ought to go invade this country thousands of miles away, 25 million people, and occupy them, everybody else would look around for you know whether the medication they're taking is actually obvious on the table or whatever. But in the United States, it doesn't seem crazy because of America's identity and the way we view our role in the world. And that is a kind of a necessary <coughs> Uh, condition, although not a sufficient condition, obviously, to send us to war. But if you don't have that, you're probably not going to have a decision like that. So that's one dominant factor. And one of the interesting things about our debate right now, generally, is um, there are cracks in this facade, right? There's a lot of debate about restraint and overextension and too much, uh, you know, too many of these interventions. So how that essential consensus gets modified, it will be interesting to see over the coming years. Second thing is a sense of kind of urgent imperative that we have to act. And here I kind of talk about this distinction between what are sometimes called uh, logics of consequences and logics of appropriateness, where there's a lot of different kind of frameworks out there to understand people who are thinking in a classic utility calculating cost benefit way. I'm going to total up the costs and benefits and see is this on the margin good for me or people who are in the mindset of a moral imperative, that come to believe we don't have any choice, we have to do this. And although on the one hand, you know, pretty much every or most, the vast majority of theories of decision-making and IR and all the rest, talk about people being in the utility calculating mind, recurrently in these cases, you see senior officials getting in this mind 
of a moral imperative. And that's exactly what happens in the Iraq case. After 9-11, uh, they very quickly or eventually come to believe that this is simply something that is an imperative for them to do if they are to fulfill their obligations to the American people. We have to do this. Just like you see rhetoric for the Bay of Pigs saying we have to get rid of Castro, just like there's a lot of moral imperative rhetoric around the Vietnam decisions that we don't really have a lot of choice. I mean, this is part of the tragedy of LBJ, right? In so many of his discussions, he's saying, I don't really want to do this, but I don't have any choice for a range of reasons. So when you get senior officials into this mindset, and when you start hearing the public rhetoric of, we have to do this, then, for example, you don't care about warnings. What do warnings about risk mean if you're in the minds of a moral imperative? You're having to do something. You're following this kind of obligation. And then the third factor, which kind of complements the other two, is the existence of a clever scheme that convinces senior decision makers that the risks and costs of war will be low. So in this case, it's obvious, right? You get Wolf Whitsnow saying, look, we just did this in Afghanistan. We're going to go in, throw somebody in power, get the heck out, and we're done. Which is why folks like Rumsfeld, I mean, Wolf Whitsnow is a fascinating character and has sort of both sides of this debate in his mind at the same time. But why folks like Rumsfeld and Cheney just kind of could brush off these warnings like that memo I was talking to you about. Because they're like, what are you guys talking about? We're not going to be there very long. And as you may know, the military planning said we get in and immediately begin withdrawing troops. And we're down to about 30,000 troops by September of 2013, so within six months of going in, and down to a minimal force soon thereafter, which is part of the reason why it's so difficult for them to accept the early warnings of an insurgency because their mindset was, I'm not governing the place, I'm getting out. Now, if you know, one of the most common, tragically hilarious parts of this research was reading all the DOD policy memos that are like 75 different ways of having your cake and eating it too, which is we're gonna go in and transform Iraq, but we're not really gonna stay. So you've got memos that say, we're going to go in and govern with a light hand, and we're not going to be occupiers, and blah, blah, blah. And oh, by the way, the new Iraqi media system that we set up is going to be open and transparent and free, and it's going to have full rights for all of these different specific ethnic groups that we will enumerate. Here's what the new Iraqi constitution is going to look like, et cetera, et cetera, right? So they wanted at the same time to shape what Iraq was going to look like, but not pay the cost of shaping what Iraq was going to look like. And to me, the number one decision failure is that nobody forced them to resolve that essential dilemma. Because either you have to say, we have to accept the risk that there's going to be a chaotic civil war, but it's not our responsibility if we're going to go in light and get out quick, or we have to accept the cost of going in. And as, you, as I would argue, that if President Bush got up and said, we're going to go in, to make Iraq into a democracy, we're going to stay for 20 years, we're going to spend three to five trillion dollars, we're going to sustain thousands, and eventually, if we stay really that much more, well, thousands of US casualties, there are going to be tens of thousands of Iraqi casualties. That's what I have in mind. You would have had a very different debate in late 2002 and early 2003 than you had. But that wasn't their concept. You see these kind of schemes in every uh, US foreign policy tragedy. In Vietnam, right? The scheme was you can listen to the tapes where LBJ is telling people, we're, in 1964, he was still saying, we're not sending our boys to fight this war, we're going over to train them so they can fight this war. That was the scheme. If you read the discussions of the Soviet intervention in Afghanistan, you could take out the word Afghanistan and put in the word Iraq, because it's exactly what the United States was trying to do. We're gonna go in, prop up this guy, and get out, and then, as there had been before, there will be a pro-Soviet regime that's running its own security. There's always a way we convince ourselves that the costs are going to be low. So that, to me, gives kind of a framework to look for in discussions of Iran. For example. <coughs> Do you see a discussion in the general U.S. foreign policy community that seems to be taking for granted the idea that the United States has the right to go and attack Iran and impose a certain vision of non-proliferation if we want to as a function of our kind of sense of exceptions. Do you see a lot of phrasing that makes you believe there's an imperative-driven mindset at work? Do you see schemes being talked about? 
where they say, oh, this won't cost a lot. We just launch a few cruise missiles or we'll put in a few special, whatever. If you see those factors, then watch out. I mean, it's not necessarily that every one of those things is going to be a tragedy, but. So the final thing that I, that I talked a little bit about is, you know, applying it to those kind of current situations and thinking about how the framework is relevant um, to what's going on today. And one of the things I talk about is this idea of policy negligence. Um, and, and I was struck to think about it because one of my interviewees was a different uh, senior NSC person who was just absolutely furious about Rumsfeld's role and thought, and, and the phrase he used was criminally negligent. And there's a whole other story to be told about defense officials coming to interagency meetings and refusing to say anything, Refu Rumsfeld refusing to share documents with other participants in the process, just terrible. So I thought, I didn't think about it for a while, and I came back to it at the end and sort of thought, okay, criminal <coughs> negligence, does that mean that we, you know, how would you think about that? Because we don't, when you think about that in policy sense, but then when you think about it, there certainly is a legal standard for negligence. If, um, I mean, like Boeing today with the 737 MAX, whatever, or like Ford Motor Company puts a car on the road that their engineers did an incompetent job of preparing with dangers that they were warned about, you can sue them and get money. In theory, some <laughs> officials could even be prosecuted. Why don't we think about that in national security? So I kind of asked the question of four criteria that would sort of identify when there's negligence. Have decision makers carefully interrogated the rationale for a proposed action? The reason, why are we doing this? Are we going to liberate? Are we going to just get rid of Saddam or whatever? Have they done a thorough processing of information relevant to the choice? Pretty obvious. They look for all the information they collect. Have they deeply and seriously considered potential risks and taken meaningful steps to mitigate them? And then fourth, have they approached the debate about this choice, both internal to government and in the wider democratic society, to make sure it's as open and honest as possible, one designed to generate the freest possible debate? Now, to me, those seem like pretty self-evident things that as a policymaker, you would want to make sure you do. None of those things were done. And in some cases, actions were taken that were pretty close to the opposite of those criteria. And, you know, without getting too personal about this, I just noticed yesterday, like, you know, on the University of Virginia Miller Center hosting a lecture by Condoleezza Rice. So people that are involved in these decisions go off and they go back to teaching, they go on their corporate boards and everything. And there were standards that if you were an executive of a major corporation, you might be very well be held legally liable for the level of negligence that you brought to that decision. But this is a decision to go to war, the most profound decision a democracy can make. And we would never think of holding, I mean, except for like really extreme cases, right? The quality of a decision process, you want to hold somebody responsible for that? On the one hand, it seems kind of crazy. And I'm not saying send people to jail. I mean, I make very clear that I'm not making an argument about that. But in terms of as a nation, when someone is taking the job of national security advisor, do we want them to think they are going to be held liable to a standard of the quality of the decisions they oversee? And if they get it wrong, they might not go to jail. But at least in the court of public opinion, through established mechanisms, commissions, I don't know, that we will look back on whether they were negligent in the way they did their job. And if they were, they can count on a different post official life than if they weren't. I don't, I'm very clear in saying I'm not quite sure about the answer to that question. But I do know that this decision was made negligently. Negligently. And that senior officials who had opportunities were given direct warnings and had opportunities to do much better did not do so. What do we do with that? We say, yeah, well, it's human. There's human mistakes, tragedies happen. Maybe, maybe. That's not an irrational answer. But anyway, it's a problem this level. So I think it leaves us with that issue, and it leaves us with some lenses to look through as we assess current debates about going to war to try to avoid another crisis. So I will stop there, take your questions and thoughts and <laughs> arguments about that decision.
Yes. Where do you think Paul Bremer fits in to this whole thing? And like, if he didn't, if debathification didn't happen, was yeah. everything still doomed to fail at the same level, or was that still a, a critical decision that was made? Was was that a decision he made on his own, or something that involved more? Yeah. So Bremer is, you know, one of the things I really struggled to do in this was. was uh, not, and I'm not saying your question is, but like not caricature people, you know, and really try to get information and present them as, I frankly was, because I've talked to a lot of people who, who had absolutely career worst experiences in dealing with Paul Brown, particularly folks in USA. There's other people that love the guy, absolutely love the guy and find him the most inspiring boss they ever had from the Iraq experience. I think Bremer is more of a symptom than uh, those two decisions, the de-athification and the disbanding the army, you know, you could have made them the opposite way and it would have made a 5% difference, honestly, I think. Um, to me, the real issue is you have a policy process in the US government that's gonna go take possession of a country of 25 million people, appoint a civilian administrator that they have not identified before they invade that they approach with a week's warning before he has to leave for the country. They get a guy who has never been to that country in his life, does not speak the language, has never done post-conflict stabilization, has never run a large organization larger than a small embassy. What the hell is going on, right? So I think, you know, he, on the one hand, he was trying to do the best he could under bad circumstances. He certainly demonized some critical actors in the process. Um, and, and I think adopted much too much of an, I'm in charge, uh, decisive decision making is the way I have to approach this kind of a way of going about it. I think those two decisions were both mistaken, uh, but they certainly were not the thing that doomed the, the doomed it to chaos. It was going to be chaos either way. I think the more fundamental dilemma is that earlier one of either you're going in really big or you just don't care about the aftermath. Doing a halfway thing in the middle was the thing that guaranteed disaster. Yeah. If war in Iraq was considered to be sort of an inevitable process in the early 2000s, is there anything Saddam could have done short of leaving power that would have stopped the war? So, yeah. I mean, of course, the irony is that Saddam did what we demanded that he do in the 90s, but he kept it secret because he's just that dumb, I guess. But not dumb, but I mean, obviously, so he decides to give up WMD, but then says, well, I can't let the Iranians know I did that because then they might attack me. So I'm going to give up WMD, but I'm going to do it secretly. But American intelligence is so awesome that they'll figure out what I did and then we'll be pals. So there's that huge irony. Um, I mean, Saddam kind of thought he was trying to cooperate. I think a lot of the problem is that the inspecting regime was, or the, the inspection process was dealing with a regime with so many different actors whose habitual response to any outsider was to deny information. And, and then, you know, a big moment becomes when they do, I think in December of 2002, if I'm remembering, maybe January, uh, where they do their declaration of here's all the information on our programs. That regime is too incompetent to do something that's really would be seen as, you know, a brilliant check mark saying they've really told us what they're doing. So um, did they harass and kind of slightly obstruct some of the inspectors? Absolutely, yeah. Um, Hans Blix is part of the problem, quite frankly. You know, if Rumsfeld is the master of dissembling and like obscure statements, Han Blick, Han Blick is a close second, where he kept coming back to the UN and saying, well, we have access to all the places we're going, but it's not quite what we wish, but we're finding no evidence they have anything, but we're not sure we find all the evidence, but this, but that, but the other thing. Um, and so, you know, he makes what is a three-quarter cooperating situation, I think, look like something a lot worse than it actually is. So the only thing Saddam could have done differently was been, yes, he could have, you know, made a much more public show of the fact that he was cooperating, invited, for example, French, Russian, other representatives, and said, look, I'm serious about this. 
if anybody's telling you they're not get access, getting access, come back to me and tell me, he could have been much more clever about using the cooperation he was giving to hamstring the United States. And I think he, if he had done that full bore and in a really smart way, he might have been able to forestall war. He just might have. But, of course, it is not his mentality to prostrate himself before the international community. So it was never likely he was going to do this, and some of the planners of the war knew very well that it was never likely that he was going to do that, and they were counting on the fact that he was never going to do that. And there's even memos where people are expressing in the U.S. Defense Department their number one fear is that he will start to cooperate in ways that make war impossible. Because the goal was war, not successful inspections. Yeah? So there's the argument out there that it's in the Iraqi regime's interest to deceive the international community or its neighbors about its weapons. Mm -hmm. And that provides the explanation for partly why there was so much confusion over it. Do you still uh, attribute it mostly to incompetence in his or in Saddam's regime? Or is there some power to that argument? Power of the argument that they were actively trying that they that they, they, they were, were actively they trying were, to really still Iran, Israel, the United States. Well, yeah, they, sure. I mean, he was he was again trying to do both things at the same time. So yes, um, and when he gave the order to shut it down, his order was shut it down, but keep the ability to open it back up later. So send the scientists off to have a nice tea for ten years, and then we'll start it again. I mean, you know. It, so some people make the argument that, well, clearly then it was still justified because he was, if the, if the case of the American people in 2002 had been, well, he doesn't actually have WMDs. And, he, and, he, and our pressure worked in getting him to shut down his WMD program. But he might start him again someday, so we're going to invade. Okay, that's not a case that anybody buys into, right? So uh, now I don't believe, an, a, another question of this is whether there were any U.S. officials that really knew in their hearts that he had given it up but didn't tell anybody because they wanted to justify a war. I do not, I put it this way, in my research, I found no evidence that that was the case. I found no evidence that, you know, all these things that they lied to the American people, that we like, you know, an interesting recent example is this, um, I forget, I'm gonna forget the title off, but this British film that just came out with Kira Knightley about the British whistleblower that, um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Yeah, no, that's what I've been thinking about. Yeah, that, so, she discovered a, a very particular thing, which was this report uh, that the United States was asking Britain to cooperate in spying on third parties at the UN to force them into voting for the resolution, which is kind of a, it's not about like the decision to go to war, but there's a lot of rhetoric in that, of like Rizzi Ifans, the actor screaming into phones, they're lying to us, it's all based on lies, you know, it's kind of this, and I just, I just, that's just not, to me, that's just not true in the sense that the senior officials in the U.S. government, I believe, believed in their, really believed that there was a significant WMD capability. There really was some degree of ties or significant risk of ties to terrorists that keeping the American people safe meant doing this. And when they said that publicly, at times, absolutely dictated, Cheney exaggerated what was, when he said they reconstituted their nuclear weapons, the intelligence did not say that, clearly did not say that. So to me, that's like not a typical exaggerating, you know, as Atchison said about the early Cold War, clear, talking clearer than truth. But the essential idea is they still said, okay, they would have said, yeah, that's an exaggeration, but fundamentally what I'm saying, I believe that he really has capabilities that are dangerous and we have to deal with. So um, I, I don't believe the argument that actually there was a lot more there and he intended to keep a lot more there than, than we knew. But I also don't believe the argument that it was all lies. I'm not making an argument for just no, no, I know. just the intelligence confusion and, and so on. Yeah. And his potential success. Well, and a big, success. right, and a big part of, I mean, in the intelligence picture, you know, as you guys probably know, I mean, part of the problem is the end of the Gulf War, the U.S. intelligence community gets burned because they say, wow, he was a year away from the nuke and you didn't know that? So now they, their, their impulse, even separate from the political pressure from Cheney's office, their impulse is to over-report rather than under-report. Um, 
but if you know there's there's definitely some like there are different ways of looking at intelligence one of the most fascinating things i i sort of uh i mean it's in the public you know other stuff that's written but like the slam dunk comment when uh tenet says to, to bush it's a slam dunk case for this why does he say that he says that because they have a meeting where they're going to lay out all their intelligence to President Bush and say, here's what we got. And President Bush's reaction when he hears all of that is, huh? Where's the good stuff? I thought this was clear. But I don't get it. I can't make a case for war on that. What are you talking about? At which point, Tennant says, don't worry, Mr. President, it's a slam dunk, which, you know, I, I don't. I, I'm, I'm loath to be too personally critical of individuals because none of us can know what we would have done in that situation. But that's one of the more irresponsible things that happens in this process. If a, if a senior decision maker is saying, tell me the nuanced truth about intelligence, it should never be the business of an intelligence professional to say, don't worry about the nuances. It's clear. You can just close your mind and accept that it's truth, right? Because interestingly, and I would talk to other folks in the intelligence community, you say, you know, the first time we briefed Connie Rice on this, her reaction was exactly the same. You gotta be kidding me, that's the best you got? Where's the rest of it? If senior officials kept having that reaction, somebody at some point should have said, well, if that's our reaction, maybe there isn't really stuff there. But it was this overwhelming, you know, and I've talked to other people who said, who were skeptics of the war, and were not like bought into this, who said, look, don't blame them, Mike, because all of us were caught up in this just assumption that, it was true even if we didn't have every last thing, right? So you have other, uh, others in the US intelligence community, there's this famous J2 assessment that's been declassified, some of you may have read, where the head of the J2, the Joint Staff Intelligence thing, puts out a couple page memo that says, yeah, no, guys, this is a lot less clear than everybody's saying. On the nuclear side, we know almost nothing. On the chem bio side, we think we know some things, but and I forget he has the percentages in there. It's like 90% of what we don't know on the nuclear side and 60% of what we don't know on the other side. There's a lot of inference going on here. And that thing is stamped, seen by SecTech. So there's lots of opportunities that people had wanted to to delve into that. The problem is there was never that impulse. Because immediately after 9-11, they're in the mindset of an imperative. There's something we have to do. We're not interested in the details anymore. We have to do this. So. Anyway, long story short, I'm telling you. Yeah, Tim. Uh, so, I guess in terms of the British, obviously the book primarily focuses on the American side, and you do touch on the British occasion. Yeah. And so I'm curious, just to what degree, because a lot of the stuff you cite, like American exceptional in terms of the sort of shock of 9 11, is sort of obviously something that also maybe applies to the case I'm seeing. So, how do you see the British shaping American decision making? And also, if you have any idea of sort of how you see allies, like close American allies, and relating to this idea of negativeness, like how can they check the features of American <coughs> Yeah, so you were asking the Lawrence Friedman question. <laughs> Where are the allies? Yeah, I, I got a review of the book from Lawrence Friedman. The, the title was like, Leaving the Allies Out of the Iraq War Story or something. And his criticism was the book didn't deal with the British enough. And I was kind of like, it was about the American decision. But anyway, there's a lot in there about the British. <laughs> So there's a debate, my good friend Patrick Porter has written a, a, a book about the British decision called Blunder, which is really good. Um, and his, his, his argument of mine sort of aligned, I mean, part of the argument is it was Tony Blair's war on their side, right? And of course we know Tony Blair is kind of a liberal interventionist dude, and they strongly believe in the moral case for this. And so to that extent, Blair embodies some of the same thinking uh, as is in the American kind of way of looking at this. Uh, whether or not, I mean, but Patrick's argument is that the British body politic had to buy into that too, and it couldn't be Tony Blair's war, just as it was here. You know, part of what in the book, I'm very critical of Congress and very critical of the US media. And something like today, and, and I'll come back, I'll answer your question in a sec, but like, what if we end up at, in war with Iran in two weeks, or a month, or six months? What is the war gonna look like? What are the costs gonna be? What is our strategy going to be? How is Iran gonna react? Has the New York Times, the Washington Post, got one article talking about that? Apart from just like reporting on what the discussion is inside the government? That's one of the reasons I believe that the process of winning war is broken, is that there's no real national debate about what a war is going to be, in part because the media doesn't, I don't know, they think people are not interested or something. But anyway, I digress. 
I rant. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, on the bridge side, you have a whole parallel set of developments. You've got the dodgy dossier and other dossiers that come out and give the intelligence picture. You've got the argument about WMD and ties to terrorists. You've got a, 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 a similar British worry about terrorism to what you have in the United States. So in a lot of ways, they're kind of more preset to have, to go along with a similar view of this. And I would say probably on their side, the, the big all, additional factor that one of the consensus points in their national community, national security community is the special relationship and our world role kind of demands that we support the United States where we can. So you have a whole set of factors that lead them to ultimately say, yeah, it kind of makes sense and this is something, I mean, you have a bigger debate, of course, you have two members of their cabinet resign in protest, which you don't come close to on our side. So a much bigger public, public protest there. So, so it's more of an intense debate and it's a closer run like question of whether the country's really on board a lot of the same dynamics, I think. Yep. Professor Mazur. Um, first, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so two related questions. Uh, one, you, you put within the uh, framework of American exceptionalism, this uh, willingness to not ask the hard questions in the decision-making process, not to try to test the assumptions. Is that connected to um, the sort of, I don't know if it's fair to call it, post-war amnesia about uh, all this decision-making. So, and yeah. the second would be, okay. um, you, you suggested that uh, the Soviet Union entered a similar process. Might uh, current-day uh, China um, confront something, something ah. similar and how might that play out? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, so on the first question, I, so I meant to distinguish sort of exceptionalism and the role of the imperative as two overlapping but different things. And the one kind of sets the stage for the other. But that idea of getting in the mindset of, of not being that concerned about doubts and stuff like that is more, I mean, it's, it's related to both. Um, okay. But it's, it's more a product of the imperative. Certainly in other cases, I mean, although I was working the Pentagon at the time, and I don't think it was very accurate in a lot of ways, Obama's award by Woodward gives a good example of a very different kind of policy process, where a president tries very much to meet all of these criteria, and at the time was, was criticized for exhaustively right, debating a potential choice to expand a war, not even to start a war. So it's not universal in the American experience that that you get that, but certainly at some circumstances. Um, and to times in which, you know, I think for anybody who's uh, in or gonna be in, maybe in uh, the policy process, it's a, it's a very useful question to ask of what would I do at that moment when everybody who raised their hand even tentatively and said, are we sure this is the right idea, got told in no uncertain terms, get with the program, I don't wanna hear it, you're gonna risk your career if you keep talking about that, be quiet and sit down because this decision has been made at higher levels. And whether you're willing to continue to write memos and say, no, um, at a minimum you have to consider these risks is, is an issue. The China question, um, I don't, you know, I, I can't really answer that question obviously because I don't, I'm not, a, uh, I, I'm not a friend of China, I don't know as much about their decision making process. Um, it's been fascinating to read some of the stuff that's come out on the uh, decision-making process around Tiananmen that's been publicized. It was a big book that came out a few years ago, and just recently, I think Andrew Nathan <coughs> and maybe some others had a piece in Foreign Affairs with some updated information about that. Um, I think you can see, it, it would be very different because I think China doesn't have anything like, it has its own sense of, you know, hierarchical middle kingdom, you know, we should tell everybody what to do kind of mentality, but in a very different way from American interventionist exceptionalism, I think. Um, I think that the other aspects of getting into some sort of crisis where your decision making becomes driven by urgent imperatives and you come to a decision that a certain course of action is mandatory rather than something you've decided as the, uh, you know, the right thing to do by a cost benefit calculation, I think is something that can, you know, that can crop up anywhere. And obviously an enormous risk of the current trajectory of US-China relations is 
you know, part of part of the goal of statesmanship, right, is to avoid moments like that. And we're uh, blithely creating them right now in ways that are awfully dangerous with North Korea and Iran too. So anyway, okay. yes. So thanks for your time. We appreciate it. Uh, you talked a bit about the policy making decisions that were being made uh, in some inertia behind World War II in Iraq. What role did you see in the military, the senior brass of the military uh, yeah. playing with regards with respect to going into Iraq? That's a that's a fascinating question. Um, and I will say, so I talked to a, a lot of military officers, a lot of senior military officers. In retrospect, I wish I had done even more to push on that. Um, because the more you find out about it, the more you sort of ask yourself, didn't you read Dereliction of Duty? You were all told to read it. Um, so there, there just wasn't, as far as I've been able to determine, you know, the, the famous case is Shinseki's testimony, right, and by like, by February 2003. Think about that testimony, is that testimony is questions he was asked. It was not, and partly to his credit, he was not trying to go beyond his, his role and force this or just publicly whatever. But had he not been asked, he would never have said it. Then it but when he was asked, to his great credit, he told what he thought was the truth. And then Secretary White, to his credit, stood by him afterward uh, against Rumsfeld. So there's, there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, I, I think good um, sort of role playing there. Broadly speaking, Rumsfeld complained afterward that if the chiefs had really thought this was a bad idea, they should have told me because no one spoke up. And I have found no evidence to contradict them. So you had plenty of tanks, you had plenty of briefings. A part of the dynamic here, you know, it's really interesting to see what happens, the, the, the implications of the dominance of regional combatant commanders. When they get put in charge of war planning, We've all heard the profane phrase that Tommy Franks used to describe the chiefs, Title 10 MFs, right? And that is the mentality of the regional combatant commanders, which is the chiefs are trained and equipped figureheads, stay out of my lane when it comes to war planning. And that was his attitude. And so once you get a chain of command established where it's President Rumsfeld Franks, war planning in that silo, other people, including even the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, will say, it is not my job to meddle in that. If the civilian leader believes the war planning is not where it should be, they can push on that. But that's the chain of command. And I'm not in the chain of command. Now, is that an adequate answer? If folks really believe that the military planning was insufficient, if folks listen to Tommy Franks, I mean, to give you an example, talk to another a senior civilian official who referred to one meeting, well, this has been reported lots of times, he's referring to the meeting where Franks made a reference to Lord Mayors, right? So they're talking about post-war planning, Condi Rice comes close to, I think, playing the role the National Security Advisor could have, which is to go to Bush and say, this is really not where it needs to be. And she said, I'm getting some warnings about the post-war planning stuff, you ought to ask about that. So they ask in a planning meeting where Franks is briefing the war plan, you got the post-war sewn up. What's he going to say? No, Mr. President, actually, now that you mention it, oh my God, there's supposed to be a phase four to this. We haven't even thought about it. They had it. It's just the wrong setting, right? It's not going to. So he says, uh, we got a Lord Mayor is appointed for every town and village, which was a lie, which was an out and out untruth. What he was thinking, I don't know. My suspicion is he didn't think he was lying to the president. But it was not true. And other people in that room knew it was not true. But it was one of the senior civilian officials told me, Mike, when you have the, the commander planning the war, tell the president they have it down, and it is the phase four part of the military plan, what do you want me to do at that point? Go back to the president and say he didn't really mean it? I happen to know he lied to you, right? So. Part of the dynamic here is the particular planning process for war that now exists, where when a president and a SECDEF go to CENTCOM or UCOM or whatever it is, and they're working that out, the rest of the Joint Chiefs 
really have to make a grenade of their career if they're going to get involved. Unless a president pulls them aside and says, look, whoever, I want your best military advice. I need more people. We're, we're outside the room of Tommy Franks. You tell me. And if you, if I find out later you're not honest with me right now and you had doubts you're holding back, I swear to God I will end you. So tell me what you really think. But if, when do we think of a president doing that? That's not what presidents do. So anyway, it's an enormously complicated situation. I happen to think there were senior military officials that could, uh, uniformed officers that could and should have done a lot more. Uh, it is my belief that some regret that. But at the end of the day, you know, because of the chain of command, this was not their responsibility in that sense, right? They're not in the chain of command. They would have had to go beyond what their their actual assigned duties were to make that happen. Pardon me. Yeah. Uh, just a dumb question. In terms of American decision making, um, did your research at all focus on the State Department, especially INR's role in rejecting the WMD assessment? And how yeah. the presidents and the executive branch sent this ignored that assessment? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, it was, again, it was just sort of the momentum of the, the, the general view, which was there's INR, you've got this joint staff thing hanging out there, you've got handfuls of individuals that are trying to say it's not as strong as you think. Um, but the, those were quite literally footnotes, right, to the uh, otherwise consensus view of the intelligence community that gets presented to senior officials who have spent 10 years looking at or hearing about intelligence that says the same thing. And in a mindset that says, our nation has just been attacked, my risk calculus is different than it was before that happened. So, you know, it's interesting, it's the same thing you can ask about in January 2003, the Intel Committee puts out a couple of, uh, partly because uh, Paul Pillar um, and some others really just forced it to happen, puts out a couple of memos warning about possible uh, post-war situations. Now the memos are kind of mixed and they're not like a clear warning that this is just going to happen, but they do lay out some dangers. And I asked some senior defense officials, like, what do you think about those when they came out? And they said, eh. they said it could happen. People issue warnings all the time. Sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong. What do you want me to do with it? You know what I mean? So the, the warning or the evidence that forces someone who's on an established course of action to divert has to be more than just this could go wrong or this might not be true. So, so do you think that the State Department should have pushed further on those things? Well, the State Department, I mean, that's another thing that I, you know, I talk about in the book is the role of the State Department, particularly for Colin Powell. They didn't like push hard on anything. I mean, I think partly at some point, and I can sort of understand this, uh, I, was, I was very surprised at the number of State Department people I talked to who were kind of squirmy about the role that Colin Powell played in all this, who admire him tremendously, fantastic Secretary of State in so many ways, the best manager of the State Department had in a long time. And on this issue, look, I don't know what he actually decided or thought. From all the evidence, you would infer that at some point he decided, you know what, the hell with it. Rumsfeld and Cheney are determined to have this war. I don't disagree that Saddam Hussein needs to go. The president has strongly implied to me he's made the decision. It's, you know, because part of it, as I discuss in there, is obviously the legacy of his military service and believing that when a president seems to have decided something, it's my job to support that. And there's honor in that perspective. It's what a military officer should have done. Um, you know, again, the, the problem is that this process demanded iconoclastic senior officials willing to cause enormous trouble at huge risk to their own careers. And because in the middle of the decision, you can't know, like, you know, you guys are probably too young to really have thought about this too much, but I remember very much thinking on the eve of the war, well, I don't think this is a good idea, but maybe it'll turn out for the best. You know, Saddam's a bad guy. Maybe, I, mean, I, I wasn't part of the process, right? I didn't have, but still, there's that temptation when you're in the middle of it. If we're about to launch 100 cruise missiles into Iran, oh, they won't retaliate by escalating the great regional war. I mean, that would be stupid, right? <laughs> Before it's happened, 
you know, in retrospect, you'd say, well, if I'd known how it was going to play out, of course I would have marched into the president and then issued my resignation and then gone to the press and said whatever. At the time, it's not that clear. So you put all that together, and yeah, the State Department, neither Powell nor Rice, who were to me the more independent thinking uh, people in the process, and who at different times tried in some ways, the closest he comes right is his August 2002 dinner with the president, where he asked Kenny Rice to see him and he says, look, do you know what you're getting into? That message could have been, you're getting into something really bad, but I'm not even sure Colin Powell really believed that the evidence was strong enough that he should make an unqualified case against the war. So no, he, the, the State Department never took the INR intelligence estimate or other warnings that came out of state. Uh, and there are lots of state people that end up being very frustrated that they put warnings up and they died at the secretary's level. Yep. Go ahead. Yep. So, sir, um, you mentioned the negligence in the national security decision making. Yeah. And is there any good way of um, minimizing the risk of? Um, well, that's the million dollar question, and I don't know. I honestly don't know because I sort of I deal with that in the last chapter. I'm kind of like, well, you really don't, um, you don't want to have like formal investigations afterward where people are like prosecuted or something because you don't want to have people feeling like they're writing six memos to justify everything they did because they're going to be under the threat of you know, legal action later. Um, you can't really create like, what, an inspector general function or something, you know what I mean? So, as I think is, is I thought for a long time, with studying the policy making process, it starts with the president and there is absolutely no substitute for a president who puts out the word that I am determined to have an effective, rigorous, analytical process that gives me the best information to make the best judgment. And if I don't get it, I'm a whole so many responsible. If the president says that, a lot of stuff will start to fall right. When a president is quite clearly not interested in that, it's the beginnings of a lot of things going wrong. And clearly, you know, um, I think President Bush in some ways had an interest in that, but was just not enough of a reader and not was too impatient in a lot of things to really make that happen. So if you start with that, it's a place to start. But that's not something you can impose, right? It's just the luck of the draw if you get a president who, uh, and then I think I suggest a couple of small things. Like I, I do believe that part of the problem with the policy process, and this is sort of inherent to it, and I don't know if there's anything to do about it, is that senior officials involved in it, there's just no getting around the fact that it is set up for group I mean, if you're sitting around a cabinet table, everybody there, inevitably, it is human that they are constantly thinking about preserving their position in that group as much as they are thinking about getting the right answer on a given policy problem. And holding back what they think, all that sort of stuff. And, and I don't think you're really gonna change that. I do wonder if there is a possible role, if you know, a president were to come in and say, I'm going to have uh, a group of three or four senior ombudsman advisors. They are gonna sit in on all cabinet meetings, um, dealing with national security issues. Um, they are gonna have access to all the policy documents flowing around the interagency, they, all this stuff. And I'm gonna meet with them periodically. And they are my canaries in the coal mine. They are the people who do not have a line responsibility and who frankly, I will pick them because I know they won't give a damn if I fire them halfway through or if they make enemies of so-and-so. And I am going to count on them for the unvarnished, you know, truth. Um, as we all know, a really good leader tries to convey something of that message to people that work for them anyway, which is that I want that from you, that's part of what I need from you. But at the most senior levels in government, there's a degree to which it's just never gonna be true of the main cabinet positions, I think. So I think it would be interesting to wonder if something like that could, but again, you've got to have the appetite on the part of the president. And sometimes presidents, again, with this imperative, sometimes the president's mindset is, I've decided what the right thing is. 
for myself, for my political position, for the country, whatever. I don't need anybody to tell me that. It's why I'm here, to have that instinctual decision. Um, so to have people sitting around who are going to go off and write books later told me it was a bad idea and I did it anyway, why do I want that? My job is I'm the decider, right? So I, I don't even know if any president would be interested in that. It's, an it's a good question, an extraordinarily hard question. But like I said, you know, the, the, as we all know, the, the, the sort of great modern example of this is the first Bush administration, where both because of the experience of the people involved, the appetite for rigor in the decision process, and the relationships among them, you put all those three things together, and they still made mistakes and didn't do everything, of course. But it's harder to point to cases where they were negligent in the way they approached a major decision. You didn't see it as much. And I think Obama's got a pretty good record on that, too. Any last questions? Getting close to the end. All right. Well, thank you all for coming out. It's been a great discussion.